These are an unspectacular couple who kind of generally kept themselves to themselves. They were living, from an external perspective, a relatively normal life. All along, it transpires that many years earlier, they travelled up to Mansfield together and in cold blood, shot and murdered two relatively elderly people, buried them, carried on with this pretense that they were still alive for all of these years, took all of their money off them, and yet blew it all on ridiculous memorabilia. This is my first script, so I, I can't really speak from experience, but it felt like making a story out of that was really, really difficult because you can't just make stuff up. I had nightmares about it when I first started researching and reading the police interviews and the um, court documents, not because of the horror so much of, of the violence of what happened, but like just the feeling of having a secret literally buried in your garden. Sometimes a true crime story just grabs you and won't let go. And it's not easy to tell why. You have to know everything that happened, and it's all you want to talk about. But the origins of the obsession are obscure. There's no one thing that you can point to that drew you in. But other times, you know exactly what it was that gripped you. Those odd moments that make you stop and think, wait, what happened? The scenes that you're still wondering about long after the final instalment has ended. Those are the ones that turn a simple retelling of a case into a story that you can't get out of your head. I'm Caroline Crampton, a long-time fan of crime fiction and the true stories that inspire it. In this five-part companion podcast, I'm going to take you behind the scenes of Landscapers, and together we're going to discover the real-life events that make this story so compelling, and follow the creative team as they turn this extraordinary case into an unmissable television drama. I wanted to be really honest about how incredible the story was and how incredible, she, you know, what she and Chris got up to was. And I, I'm not referring to the to the killings themselves, but everything around it and all the sort of while the details of the case. I wanted to be upfront that I thought some of that was astonishing and in fact funny in many ways. And there were all sorts of like crazy details that sort of took your breath away. This is Ed Sinclair, the creator and co-writer of Landscapers, a new four-part drama from HBO and Sky that brings the true story of Susan and Christopher Edwards and the murders they were convicted of to the screen. We'll be hearing more about the details of the case throughout this companion podcast from some of the real people involved. While Ed, along with director and co-writer Will Sharp and other members of the production team, will be our guide to the creative decisions made in transforming it into television. From the beginning of his involvement with the story, Ed felt like it was worth exploring how people get embroiled in tragic situations like this. From a purely practical point of view for society, it, it does pay to work out why people do things like this. I wouldn't say that we're doing a service to, <laughs> to justice with, with this thing, but I think those, you know, thinking about, there's a lot Rightly, there's a lot of energy devoted to the victims in, in crime. Um, but I think there should be a lot of energy also devoted to the thinking behind, you know, of, of the perpetrators, of offenders. But let's start at the beginning. In a police station in Mansfield, England, on the 1st of October 2013, the telephone has just rung. The way that it came to us was Christopher Edwards's mother, stepmother, she phoned the police. That's how it all began. This is Rob Griffin. At the time of this extraordinary phone call, he was a detective chief inspector with the Major Crimes Unit in Nottingham, which is the nearest city to Mansfield. When I took the first call about this case, um, which was indicating that two people may have been shot many years ago and they've been buried in their own back garden. Uh, it, that's not something I've heard often before. In fact, I'd probably say it's something that I've never heard before. DCI Griffin was initially incredulous. Surely that can't have happened, can it? 
not just in an area like that, but have happened anywhere. The two people could disappear and not be seen for 15 years and not heard from, and all along they've been in their own back gardens, having been shot by their own daughter and buried by her and her husband. This sounds like something out of a thriller, not real life. The idea that there are murder victims buried in ordinary English suburban gardens is just too fantastical. But sometimes truth really is stranger than fiction. Mansfield is a town which sits in the county of Nottinghamshire. It's a suburban area. It was surrounded by a lot of sort of former mining communities. It's a really vibrant, small, friendly, good place to live. Mansfield, which is almost exactly where you might put a pin if you were aiming for the middle of England, has a population of around 100,000. A reasonable size for an English market town, but not big by any means, and certainly not somewhere that is used to regularly coming across violent crime. To give a sense of this, last year there were 51 homicides reported in a region of 5 million people. It was a really small cul-de-sac, somewhere in the region of 10 to 15 houses, mostly semi-detached houses, so that's houses that are joined to one another. It just didn't seem possible that two people could have been shot and their bodies buried in the garden here without being seen. Their gardens are overlooked by houses from the neighbouring streets. It's fair to say that Mansfield isn't a place that very often finds itself as the backdrop for a major television series. But the place's ordinariness, its everyday virtues, are part of what makes this case so compelling. This is a staple ingredient of true crime too. The idea that something exceptionally awful can happen out of the blue in an otherwise unexceptional place, perhaps somewhere that is familiar to the audience. The interest lies in the frisson between what we think is going on and what lurks just below the surface. So this was born out of a need for us all to not lose our minds. I made one of these for myself and we had one for the office that we could just dive into in any script meeting because so much inspiration came from, you know, we all knew the case inside out but it's actually like these quirks of the case that are the kind of windows into Susan and Chris's souls. Can you just describe how yeah. many different <laughs> sticky things? Hmm. You see this is why I ran out of them so quickly. Probably, what do you think? Probably like there's hundreds just for Susan's. This is Jess Hill who was the script executive on Landscapers. She worked on the show from the early stages and helped Ed to turn their vast body of research about the true story into a fictional drama that would work on the screen. During the course of her work on the show, Jess assembled this huge annotated folder that she's showing us now, nicknamed the Bible by the team, that contains a lot of the material associated with this case, such as transcripts of police interviews and court hearings. Having everything in one place like this helped Ed and the others to keep track of what was real and what was fictional. So what we have uh, first are the police, um, so transcripts from the original interviews. So yeah, hundreds of these sticky notes. Um, because it's this question of how fact becomes fiction kind of that gets to the heart of what we find so fascinating about true crime stories. They're a way of understanding something deeper about why we tell stories at all. This is about two and a half days worth and all these post-it notes along the side are by theme. It's, it was partly to help me navigate all the information that came out and that also got fed into a big... I think, like a lot of people, I'm really compelled by true crime. There's probably something slightly salacious in it, you know, but it's a sort of, it feels like a sort of... Um, safe way, if you're just, you know, a consumer of it, of exploring your own fears about the worst things that people can do. And then there is always that really troubling factor of, you know, knowing that it's true crime. So actually these are tragedies that affect people's, people's lives and, and, you know, there's always that tension. The tension at the heart of all true crime stories 
between the real-life tragedy and the titillating fascination that such cases hold for us, was something that the creators of Landscapers wanted to explore. For Ed, finding the balance between telling the true story, respecting the victims and real people involved, and making an exciting drama on screen, was one of the biggest challenges of this whole project. How far does your duty to the real people involved go? You have to accept quite early in the process that you're telling a story. You can't do justice to absolutely every bit of the true story, even the stuff that you're most interested in. And that was the hardest thing throughout. Inevitably, there's just a whole lot more nuance to it. And you just don't physically have time to do that justice or, you know, in a, in a script. And also that sort of nuance, whilst interesting to me in a researchy sort of way, is going to be boring as hell to, to an audience or actually just physically confusing. They'll go, well, you've, just, you've told us this thing. Why are you telling us that thing? I mean, that's people, isn't it? And so you, that's the trick is to try and maintain that nuance whilst, be, whilst giving clarity on the, on the story. But yeah, I think the biggest challenge was definitely making sure we didn't get bogged down in, in a, police, a police procedural. As a senior investigating officer, the case was passed to Rob Griffin after some preliminary inquiries were made, and it seemed like there was at least some truth in what he had been told on this extraordinary phone call. But there was a problem. This Christopher Edwards, whose stepmother had made the call to the police and who seemed to be intimately involved in the mystery, was not in the UK. He was in France, where Rob and his colleagues had no jurisdiction. They had tried calling, but received no answer. So Rob decided to take a surprising step. When I became involved in the case, after a lot of sort of deliberation, I sent Christopher Edwards an email. And no, before you ask, the police don't normally email with murder suspects. This is not the way things are typically done. But then, as you're probably already realising, this was not a normal case. To think that a police officer would be emailing a person who we now know to be a double murderer is, yeah, is very unusual. It was a polite, introductory email, aimed at establishing a dialogue. The hope was that Christopher would return voluntarily to the UK to assist them with their inquiries. I told him who I was, that we'd had a call from Mrs Edwards, and that we understood that he wanted to speak to the police. A few weeks went by, and Christopher didn't write back. But then... I was actually at the Crown Court in another murder trial, interestingly. And I'd nipped upstairs into the police room at lunchtime and switched on my computer. And there on my email inbox was an email from Christopher Edwards, which said, Dear DCI Griffin, thank you for your email. We would like to surrender ourselves at the Eurostar hub and we intend to come back to England. Can you please make the arrangements for us? Kind regards, Christopher. That was the email that he sent to me. It's actually almost comical when you think about it, but that's exactly how it happened. The email was so businesslike, so polite, as if they were arranging a work meeting rather than discussing a suspect's surrender as part of a murder investigation. My first thought was to look around the room wondering, you know, which of my colleagues has sent me this as a, as a bit of a joke. Because the tactic of emailing him was always questioned. You know, it's not something that we would ever do. It's not something I've, I've ever done before and I've ever done since. But in the circumstance of that case, it seemed like the quickest route to achieving what we wanted to do, which was to engage with him and get him back. And rather incredibly, he replied. And as a result of that, he surrendered himself. On the surface, sending a few emails isn't the most dramatic thing in the world. But in this case, this exchange was absolutely pivotal and gripping, and had to be part of the drama on screen. The difficulty, Ed says, is that they're almost too weird to seem real. I had to make sense of all of the mm. realities in this, and there's, you know, there are certain elements within the story as it's ended up on screen, which are one of those classic situations where you fear what happened in real life is going to be too hard to accept for an audience because it just seems so wild, so wild. and. Those emails were definitely one of those where Chris sent very polite emails saying, you know, we appreciate your concern, <laughs> but we won't be handing ourselves in just now. And then, the, you know, the big one when he, when he came back, what the, it was, the subject heading was surrender. 
The bizarre civility of these exchanges provides valuable insight into Chris's personality, Jess thinks. And that was vital for creating the character that appears on screen. I feel like in, in a situation that he couldn't control, I always read it as Chris, that that politeness is a way of Chris asserting some control. It's a kind of a superiority thing. But also there's another reading of it, which is that these are two people who had never been in any kind of, well, certainly not trouble like this before, and that they genuinely were law-abiding and, you know... He was an accounts clerk and Susan had been a librarian and there's a kind of like quiet, modest politeness to, and British, you know, what people think of as Britishness that that manner of communicating with the police really like embodies. In between Rob's initial email to Christopher Edwards and his reply a few weeks later, the police had been very busy. But there was one part of the story that they had really focused on the part that makes anyone who hears this story stop in their tracks. The bodies buried in the garden. So at the point of my email to him, we weren't sure. But at the point of his reply to me, the excavation of the garden was complete. We'd recovered the remains of uh, Patricia and Bill. We'd confirmed by that time that they both had um, injuries consistent with having been shot twice. And so all of a sudden, that first disclosure that had been made by Christopher to his mother started to sound as if, you know, maybe a version of that had happened. Against all the odds, evidence was emerging that indicated that all the unbelievable details in that first phone call were actually true. There really had been bodies buried in the garden of that unassuming, semi-detached suburban house in Mansfield for 15 years. Reflecting on this now, Ed found that it was the sheer practicality of what the Edwards did that jumps out at him. None of us will ever know exactly what happened that night, but they had two bodies to dispose of, and that's what they did. I mean, the surprising thing about it, I suppose, is how long before those two people were missed. Not long after the bodies were discovered, the police had been able to identify them as those of William and Patricia Witcherly the parents of Christopher's wife, Susan. These two people, who had been missing for 15 years, seemingly without anyone noticing, began to come into focus a little as the police dug deeper. Beyond its sheer strangeness, this was the facet of the backyard burial that stood out to Jess. I think I was initially really struck by how someone can be missing for 15 years and no one can realise There's something really, really sad about that that I wanted to explore. Jess wasn't just intrigued on an intellectual level, though. The emotional dimension to this very domestic burial stayed with her long after she first learned of it. I was also kind of like just weirdly compelled, you know, to understand Chris and Susan more because of the sort of the strange, like, cognitive dissonance of, you know, it's so domestic. It's such like a absurd decision and story and it feels really kind of like human and fumbling and flawed to to do that and to just live with that for 15 years this like enormous secret there's something about it that really got to me we've got a small garden and I could just see you know there's a there's like a rose bush there and I and I and I had a nightmare about like having done a similar thing because just trying to imagine what it's like to live with that kind of guilt and and the way that it's clearly has warped the relationship and the way that the that Chris and Susan talk about it in their interviews is really interesting to me. Once the fact that there were two real bodies buried in this garden had emerged, the police had a difficult task on their hands. We didn't get a particularly in-depth picture of the victims because they were actually so reclusive. They didn't seem to socialise outside of their home. If they left, they'd leave together, they'd come back together. They weren't members of any clubs. They didn't seem to go to any kind of social event whatsoever. They weren't particularly close to their families. So I suppose in in that respect, you know, that I would suggest is probably quite unusual. Saying that, you know, that that is just perhaps the way that they've chosen to live their lives. And, you know, they may well have been completely happy and contented. What you can say is that in all of this, they were just two elderly, innocent people. 
The question of how to portray the Witcherlies on screen was one that Ed thought about deeply during the writing process. They are the innocent victims of this crime, without question, but they're also part of a complex web of emotion that underpins the whole case. While he was writing, Ed was very conscious of how this story might be seen by the Witcherlies family. When I first decided to write this show and to set it, broadly speaking, from Susan's perspective and Susan and Chris's perspective, to tell their story, that's difficult and that remains difficult. My hope is that the surviving relatives of, of um, the Witcherlies, I hope that they will see that this is a, a story and, and that the audience will see that this is a story that we're telling. Um, we're not saying beyond what our research has revealed about the Witchleys, we're not saying anything about what they were like in, in real life. When the police looked into the impact that this discovery in the garden had had on the surrounding residents, they found that, understandably, people were astonished to find out where their neighbours had been all this time. What came across fairly kind of consistently was a feeling of shock. This is such an unusual case, in such an unusual place, to think that it happened they did wonder where the Witchleys had gone, but I think if they'd drawn up a list of explanations for where they'd gone, that they'd been shot and killed and buried in the garden, it would not have even made its way onto the list because it's just so unthinkable. The fact that these murders took place 15 years ago and had gone undetected in all that time meant that a very different style of investigation was required. In a way, finding the bodies was the easy part. Reconstructing how they had got there and who was to blame was made much more difficult by the passage of time. All of those investigative tactics and sources of evidence that we have gotten so used to relying upon, contact trace evidence, phone data, CCTV, you know, uh, contemporary witness accounts, those sorts of things just weren't available to us in this case. We were trying to explain what had happened by delving into history and by putting together a forensic sort of picture of what we would say had happened and then stacking that up against what the two defendants claimed had happened. Nothing about this case happened as you might expect. And the fact that Christopher and Susan were willing to come back to the UK of their own free will made me raise my eyebrows when I first learned of this aspect. I think pop culture has taught us to assume that once a suspect in any investigation is safely over the border, they will do everything they can to stay there. But yet again, the Edwards surprised everybody. They had come voluntarily home from France, they said, to clear up any misunderstanding about their role in how the bodies had come to be buried in the back garden. They were innocent of murder, they claimed, and merely wished to assist the police with their inquiries. As we see in the first episode of Landscapers, their return was a highly dramatic moment in the story. But it wasn't the last surprise they had in store for the police by any means. And the minute that Christopher and Susan started to talk, well then, yeah, a whole kind of other world started to open up about their lives, which were just frankly bizarre. Although there are some things about the Edwards that make them seem unlikely murder suspects, in other ways, details about them emerged that make us question who they really were and whether they were capable of committing these horrible crimes. The classic ingredients of a murderer in a true crime story are their weirdness, their solitariness, and their ability to retreat into a fantasy version of the world. With Susan and Chris, was there something sinister lurking behind their weirdness? Using bank statements and other documentation, financial investigators were gradually able to piece together a very different narrative to the one that the Edwards were presenting to the police, one that shed a new and horrible light on their characters and actions. This reconstructed transaction history showed how using Susan's parents' money, which they had obtained through murder and deception, the Edwards had spent a small fortune on Hollywood memorabilia, autographs, photographs, stamps and letters from stars like Gary Cooper and Frank Sinatra. At the time of their surrender, they owed over £160,000, and Christopher Edwards only had £17.06 left in his bank account. All of the money that they had stolen was gone. 
In all of Rob's long experience of serious crime, he had never come across anything like this. What was the motive for these murders all about? Was it about feeling hard done by? Was it about, was it a financial motive? Probably a bit of a combination, if in all honesty, but the financial element of it, to think that you would go to those lengths to steal all of that money and then do what they did with that money. They didn't have a single thing to show for it. I think there's some fairly complex psychology going off here. You know, to buy all of that rubbish with all of that money and the lengths that they went to to get that money to then spend it in that way, I, I just find it just incredulous, to be honest. I can't, think, I can't think of a better word. I don't think I ever saw it all together, but I certainly saw all of the items. And <laughs> as, as I got to see them one by one, the next one was arguably more ridiculous than the last. Photos of Gary Cooper and, and just photos of other kind of supposedly famous people. It was, yeah, just really, yeah, just curious. When Ed was thinking about how to incorporate this element into the script, it became for him a way of accessing Susan and Chris's characters more deeply, of showing their peculiarities beyond what they chose to tell the police. I think it really is just a sort of a compulsion, really, and it's obviously a compulsion fed by by her fascination and her love for sort of, you know, old Hollywood heroes and Hollywood films that she used to watch with her grandfather. And, you know, to speculate, I think I, I would guess that that compulsion comes from a need to escape. With Chris, it's a slightly diff more difficult to pin down what his fascination with it was. I, he, he, by all accounts and by their account, it sounds like he was genuinely interested in military history, but he wasn't really into the, the sort of heroes and stuff like that. That that remained, I think, throughout mostly Susan thing. But I, he bought into Susan, so in a sense, I think he bought into that side of the fantasy as well. And the case I guess we we make or the question we ask in landscapers is did he start to feel like he needed to play a hero himself and that he that in a way those Susan's fantasy was about him about finding a knight in shining armor who'd come and whisk her away for Jess this memorabilia aspect of the case spoke to the larger emotional resonance of this story and why it surprises us at every turn maybe it goes to us wanting answers and wanting black and white um, characters in the stories that we consume in the news because essentially you kind of you're, you're looking for someone who spent it all on flash holidays and it's almost like I do think there's a degree to which it really like pulls people up short because you know there's clearly an element of greed in this story but it's not greed the way that we know it. There's something so personal intimate almost, about knowing exactly how someone chooses to spend a large amount of money, especially money that they have committed serious crimes to obtain. For Jess, uncovering the details of this hoard of memorabilia provided a more three-dimensional impression of Susan and Christopher Edwards. It gave an insight into their minds and their tastes beyond the mere facts of their actions. When you sort of look at the detail of a lot of the transcripts, I think that the Susan's fixation on memorabilia underlines how emotional her spending problems were and arguably by extension how emotional the theft of her parents' money was. And that is a lot more morally complicated to absorb. And so I think it's quite natural for people to just push it away and say, oh, that's so weird, and to kind of want to make these people seem really alien. They feel like more morally dubious people if it's just, if you kind of sell that like hoarder mentality rather than looking like the emotional nature of the spending. It seemed very much about surrounding herself with romance and nostalgia and heroes who reminded her of her grandfather and um, putting this kind of ocean between herself and and her her father and everything that he represented spending like seven thousand pounds on a gary cooper signature or you know some some particularly weird things like finding an, an invoice for a dental bill by by one of her heroes these details that just look bizarre to us now can conceal something darker and more upsetting the more I've thought about it, 
The more the memorabilia hoard seems like the outward manifestation of the Edwards' desperation, the projection of their inner dissatisfaction with their lives, and the lengths they would go to change them. It's a detail that didn't end up going into the story, but um, I think it was Susan who told police, you know, and it was a really haunting scene for us of her, you know, meeting some stranger in a car in Romford to like desperately try and sell the last of of some some memorabilia, and you know, it just seemed like such a such a desperate situation that they'd got into, you know, just the kind of the danger of of it. That really struck us. The moment that Susan and Christopher Edwards stepped off the Eurostar train from France at St Pancras Station in London was a turning point in the investigation. So the fact that they'd returned to the UK insofar as the investigation was concerned, is a hugely significant development because right from the very start of this investigation, just like in any other investigation, one of the things you are desperate to do is ask the suspects what's happened here. It might have been momentous for the police, but the mundane visual of two people stepping off a train isn't necessarily the most interesting thing to watch on television. That's why, as he was thinking about how to dramatise the Edwards' return, Ed toyed with the idea of introducing some of the fantasy and heroic elements suggested by their obsession with Hollywood memorabilia. Here's a glimpse of one early version he considered for that scene. There were, there were sort of the policemen were all sort of on like a, like a posse of, of bounty hunters in the Wild West, riding on, literally riding the horses onto the, onto the platform at... at, at um, St Pancras while the train drew in and all that sort of stuff. As much as I would have loved to see horses galloping down the train platform, ultimately it probably makes sense that the posse was cut from that scene. But that moment is still a very impactful one on screen, reflecting just how pivotal it was in the real case. The Edwards' return also shifted the spotlight from one character to another. At the start of the investigation, it was Christopher who had taken centre stage. It was his stepmother who had first alerted the police to the case, and it was he who had exchanged those bizarre emails with DCI Griffin to arrange their surrender. But the more you learn about the murders, the more it is Susan Edwards who comes to the fore. The bodies that were found buried in that garden belong to her parents. And as we'll hear in episode two, it is her version of events and the strong bond that she had with her husband that really inspired the landscapers' team as they brought this drama to the screen. Next time, we get to know Susan Edwards. Talking to people about the case, you get the sense of people being quite drawn to her. She's, she's clearly hugely vulnerable. You know, she's very mild-mannered and sweet. There are flashes of darkness, which makes complete sense, given the nature of the case. Uh, she's just a really, you know, she seems like a really complicated woman. She's very sort of polite, very articulate, and very open, really, really candid about in the way that she answered um, my questions. You can watch Landscapers on HBO and HBO Max in the US, and on Sky Atlantic and Now TV in the UK. The Landscapers podcast is produced by HBO, Sky and Campside Media. This episode was written by me, Caroline Crampton, with Joe Barrett. The producer is Joe Barrett. Our executive producer is Josh Dean. Our script editor is Natalia Winkleman. Sound design is by Joe Barrett with Rod Sherwood, who engineered the episode. Music is by Arthur Sharp from The Score to Landscapers. Special thanks to Chris Fry and Katie Carpenter at Sister.